Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a new series on managing for the Master dash till he comes. God's Covenant with Us is the, is the title for this particular lesson. It's lesson number two for January 14 of 2023. God's Covenant with Us. Hmm, let's see what that means. Let's pray. Our kind Father, guide us as we study these materials together that we may represent you correctly is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This week, we will talk about God's covenant or contract with us. Jim? From the Bible Study Guide, amazingly enough, God has made contracts or covenants with us. Most are bilateral, meaning that both parties, God and humans, have a part to perform. An example of a bilateral covenant is, if you d will do this, then I will do that, or I will do this if you will do that. A rarer type of covenant is unilateral. I will do this whether you do anything or not. A few of God's covenants and humanity with, excuse humanity. Me, with humanity are unilateral. For example, he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust, Matthew 5, 45. Following the flood, God promised humanity and every beast of the earth that there would never be another flood to cover the earth. See Genesis 9, verses 9 to 16, regarding our actions. Regardless. Regardless of our actions. He also promised, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and winter, Golden heat. Golden heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. Genesis 8, 22. The seasons will come and go regardless of what we do from the Bible study guide. You mean you can't control the seasons? That's that's an answer to global warming, all this <laughs> fantasy that well, they've been conning people with. Why is it that things go better when we do God's will? Does he manipulate circumstances? Or is it possible that doing what is right has its natural benefits? Okay, what do you think? We will not spend a lot of time this week talking about the unilateral contracts which God has promised. But what about the bilateral contracts at our part? Okay, I'm, uh, you, you're trying to sneak ahead of me and you didn't answer my question. Well, I, well, Do things go better be, when we serve God because he manipulates circumstances? Or it's just that when we do what's right, it has natural benefits? Or in the context of the great controversy, when we do what he says, is he able to bless us? Okay, couldn't he bless us anyway? And the, the devil may not allow it otherwise. What kind of control does the devil have over God? Well, he has control over us. I see. Not over God. Okay. The most important covenant that God has with us as human beings is the salvation covenant. It is available to all, but the majority of people do not take advantage of it. Those who believe that everyone will be eventually be saved and take advantage of this covenant are called universalists. And they have a lot of problems. We won't bother ourselves discussing them. Jesus clearly stated that he died for everyone. Carrie? Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Go in through the narrow gate, because the gate to hell is wide, and the road that leads to it is easy, and there are many who travel it. But the gate to life is narrow, and the way that leads to it is hard, and there are few people who find it. Okay, so now I've got another big question for you. Why is God's way hard and the gate narrow? I mean, shouldn't God make it as easy as possible for us? Does God intentionally make his way hard? Or does Satan have anything to do with it? Didn't Jesus say something about um, his yoke being light? Yeah. And um, whatever, so it's kind of... He's kind of, the situation's kind of going both ways here, isn't mm -hmm. it? My burden is easy and my, my burden is light. 
So how do people receive the gift of salvation in Jesus? Gordon? First John 5, 13, I am writing this to you so that you may know that you have eternal life, you that believe in the Son of God, from Good News Bible. And then Matthew 10, 22, Jesus said, everyone who will, every, everyone will hate you because of me, but whoever holds out to the end will be saved. <clears throat> and John 6, 29, Jesus answered, what God wants you to do is to believe in the one he sent. Again, Good okay. News Bible. So why is that such a big deal? I mean, let's think about it. What does it mean to believe in Christ? Don't most Christians and even Muslims believe in Jesus? How about believing like Christ? Okay. Well, another word for believing in Christ is in the, in the if you take the original Greek word, another way to translate that is trust. Let this mind be in you as it is in Christ Jesus, mm -hmm. Philippians 2. When Paul wrote the short book of 2 Timothy, he was imprisoned in the Mamertine prison in Rome, and I've had the privilege of visiting that place, awaiting his execution. He knew that he was about to have his head chopped off by a Roman executioner, but notice what he said. I mean, can you imagine this? Every morning you wake up, okay, do I get my head chopped off today? Okay. Uh, 2 Myra. Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that, at that day. And not to me only, but to all of them also who love his appearing. That's from the King James Version. Yeah. Paul recognized that the crown of righteousness which was awaiting him was the righteousness which he received from Jesus. Each one of us has the opportunity to accept that crown if we trust and believe in Jesus Christ. Trust means you, you accept what he says and you try to follow it. So how does one accept the crown of life or the gift of salvation? What is wrong with cheap grace? Isn't grace always cheap? Why would anyone want to refuse such a gift? What they talk, uh, using that kind of language is like it's a commodity, yeah. rather than you're dealing with a gracious creator God. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't parcel out a little bit of grace now and then and, and keep score. Let a few drops fall on me. The book of Deuteronomy is actually a collection of three sermons given by Moses to the children of Israel while they were camped in the land of Moab across the Jordan River from Jericho. During much of those, sermon, uh, much of those sermons, he talked about what they had learned from their 40 years of wandering. I mean, you can imagine how many things were there to talk about. Wow. Deuteronomy. Did they learn anything in that 40 yeah, years? Yeah, did they learn anything? Well, they came out pagans. Yeah, just about. They went well, in pagans and Amos came out. And what's that? They went in pagans. Exactly. And came yeah, out pagans. yeah. And paganism is across all religions today. <laughs> Deuteronomy is often called the Book of Remembrance, but Moses uh, ended with some very straightforward comments. Deuteronomy twenty-eight one through fourteen. If you obey the Lord your God and faithfully keep his commandments that I am giving you today, he will make you greater than any nation on earth. Obey the Lord God and all these blessings will be yours. The Lord will bless your towns and your fields. The Lord will bless your, you with many children with abundant crops and with many cattle and sheep. The Lord will bless your corn crops and the food you prepare for them. The Lord will bless everything you do. The Lord will defeat your enemies when they attack you. They will attack from one direction, but they will run from you in all directions. Now, let me interrupt for just a second. We've talked about this before, but let me just repeat this. What did we learn about the children of Israel and when they went to war? 
Do you remember? Every time they went to war following God's directions, they had marvelous victories. Every time they went to war without following directions or get, without even consulting God, they had terrible defeats. After a while, you think, hmm, wonder what's going on here. <laughs> Should we learn something? Anyway, go ahead. So, Well, sometimes you kind of forget what you're doing. Boy. The Lord your God will bless your work and fill your barns with corn. He will that's, this is an English translation, so corn there means actually wheat. Wheat, corn, okay. So, okay. He will bless you in the, the land that he gives you. If you obey the Lord your God and do everything he commands, he will make you his own people as he has promised. Then all the people on earth will see that the Lord has chosen you to be his own people and they will be afraid of you. The Lord will give you many children, many cattle, and abundant crops in the land that he promises your ancestors to give you. He will send rain in the seasons from which, from his rich storehouse in the sky and bless all your work so that you will lend to many nations but you will not have to borrow for many. The Lord your God will make you the leader among the nations and not a follower. You will always prosper and never fail. If you obey faithfully all his commands that I am giving you today, but you will you but you must never disobey them in any way or worship and serve other gods. The Good News Bible. Wow. Man, with a bunch of promises like that, how can you lose? Man, well, it seems like that never did happen, did it? Because, not really. Because um, the Romans Maybe under took the over day. and yeah. they were always under... A little bit under the days of David. Mm-hmm. Well, now, should Seventh-day Adventists be receiving special blessings from the Lord since we at least claim that we are keeping His commandments? Or were these promises listed in Deuteronomy 28 only for the Israelites? Are we not receiving special blessings? Yeah. I'm just asking. I think that we absolutely yeah. receive special blessings. Moses assured the children of Israel that it was not too difficult for them to comply with these conditions. Then in Deuteronomy 28, 15 to 68, that's so sad that I don't even want to read it. Moses went on to discuss all the things that would happen if they disobeyed God and refused to follow his guidance. The, they ranged from not getting good crops to finally eating their own children in a time of, of famine or siege. They would be con conquered by a nation coming from far away. Women giving birth to children would eat those children and even the afterbirth. Wow. Could you ever reach the place where you would consider eating a dead relative? A child even? The book of Proverbs is a book about wisdom and fo foolishness. In Proverbs 3, 1 through 10, Solomon had told his son that he would need to faithfully follow the instructions that he was, he was being given. Furthermore, he needed to trust God with all his heart and never to rely on what he thought. He was told to obey God and refuse to do what is wrong. So what does God expect of us? We're not Solomon's children. Mm. One of the first things that God asks us to do is to set aside one-tenth of our increase uh, uh, for the work of the church. God is our creator and our sustainer. Is it too much for him to ask that we give that portion to him? Furthermore, he promises to richly bless us if we do so. He suggests that the nine-tenths will end up purchasing for us more than the ten-tenths or 100% would have without paying the tithes. And some of us have had that experience a few times, obviously. Not always every time, but a few times obviously. 
kind what? of interesting, the cause and effect of this stuff. Yeah. You know, the the crops and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, what does me, what do I have to do with lying or cheating or doing something like that that affects the crops? Yeah, well, what's the relationship? Yeah, what's the relationship? Scientifically, you can't really make that connection. Yeah. But, well, we can't in our minds. Mm -hmm. God no, has a way. True. What does it mean to say that we are to give the Lord the first fruits from the writings of Ellen White? Not only does the Lord claim the tithe as his own, but he tells us how it should be reserved for him. He says, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of thine increase. What are the first fruits? The first portion. Yeah. This does not teach that we are to spend our means on ourselves and bring to the Lord the remnant, even though it should be otherwise an honest tithe. Let God's portion be set, first set apart. And this is interesting because at, at Pentecost in the land of Palestine was just as the first barley harvest was, was, being, was being reaped. And so it was appropriate to say the first fruits and whatever, and that was a, that was a good thing to happen there at the Pentecost. Um, the directions given by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul in regard to gifts presents a principle that applies also to tithing. Quote, on the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him. Parents and children are here included. That's from Ellen White, the Review and Herald, November 10 of 1896 and other places. We are not to spend our money on all the things we think we need and then give God the remnant. We are to give God the first portion. So is it possible that some of us today are losing God's blessing because we're not setting aside the tithe as the first fruits? Hmm. Does this mean that we should return our tithes before we use any of our income for other purposes? Would that be true even during times of financial stress? Even in recessions? What about even in the seven last plagues? It is very clear in the history of the Israelites that when they followed God's directions and paid a faithful tithe, they did very well. But when they turned away from God, disobeyed his commands to stop paying a faithful tithe, then they fell in hard times. And if you want to see that repeated again and again and again, read uh, Judges chapters 2 and 3. Or just read the whole Old Testament. Read the whole Old Testament. Well, clear at the end of the Old Testament history, we are told, Malachi 3, uh, Jim? Verses 7 to 11. You, like your ancestors before you, have turned away from my laws and have not kept them. Turn back to me, and I will turn to you. But you ask, what must we do to turn back to you? I ask you, is it right for a person to cheat God? Of course not. Yet you are cheating me now. How, you ask? In the matter of tithes and offerings. A curse is, all, is on all of you because the whole nation is cheating me. Bring the full tithes, excuse me, bring the full amount of the tithes to the temple so that there will be plenty of food there. Put me to the test and you will see that I will open the doors of heaven and pour out on your on you in abundance all kinds of good things. I will not let insects destroy your crops and your grapevines will be loaded with grapes. Very good, and uh, we, we wonder about this insect thing. We, we don't worry about it too much in this country. I can tell you that uh, there are um, locusts, like very large grasshoppers. I mean, I'm talking four to five inches long, huge grasshoppers that go through that area of the world. And they, they, they keep them pretty well controlled now, but if they, they don't get them controlled, and a group of those things, they just absolutely eat, eat anything that's, that's edible. Everything, trees, they strip trees of bark and everything. So, I, I, and I've lived in that part of well, down in Eastern Africa, which is at the end of that same that same Rift Valley. 
Do you think this passage with its promises applied just to the Israelites, or does it also apply to Seventh-day Adventists today? Yes. My, my question again. I knew of a farmer when I was a lad. He was an Adventist, and uh, harvest time was always in the middle of summer. And uh, there was more than one, one occasion when the, the non-Adventists lost all their crop with this one man. The fire went up to the fence line, and that was it. He got his crop. Wow. It yeah. happens with Adventists, all right. That's happened a number of times, yeah. not just on that occasion. Are there times when the fields and the houses and the automobiles and the families yeah. aren't protected? Yes, there are. There are lots of times. Yeah. Could God really pour out so large a blessing on us that we would not have enough room to receive it? What would that mean? And there's a story I read when I was a child, and that was a long time ago, a young child. It was in one of the Adventist stories about a man. This was in the, a story from the time of the Great Depression. And he had one dollar left. And he didn't know what he was going to do. He did nothing to support his family. He had one dollar left. And he knew about the paying of tithe. And so he decided to go to a store. He changed his dollar and he got, went and he took a ch one dime to the church. He paid his 10% tithe. So now we'll see what the Lord will do. And he had been applying, and of course many people were doing this in, in the depression. He had been applying here, there, all over the place to try to get a job of some kind. He had no work or whatever. The next day he got three job offers. Uh -huh. <laughs> so there's a one clear example where too much, you know, can't even, can't even do it all. Okay, who's next? Carrie, I think. Right. He who gave his only begotten son to die for you has made a covenant with you. He gives you his blessings and in return he requires you to bring your tithes and offerings. No one will ever dare to say that there was no way in which he could understand in regard to this matter. God's plan regarding tithes and offerings is definitely stated in the third chapter of Malachi. God calls upon his human agents to be true to the contract he has made with them. Zellerwein, okay. 1901. Uh-huh. Near the final days of the nation of Judah, during the times of Hezekiah, this is the southern nation, remember Israel was divided into two, the, the northern kingdom was called Israel and the southern kingdom was called Judah. Hezekiah was one of the last good kings. He initiated a true revival and encouraged people to pay a faithful tithe and worship God correctly. And this is what happened. Gordon? Second Chronicles 31.5. As soon as the order was given, the people of Israel brought gifts of their finest corn, wine, olive oil, honey, and other farm produce. And they also brought the tithes of everything they had. So Jesus, Bible. yeah, Jesus made some astounding statements to the common. And we, if we had a chance to read the rest <coughs> of that chapter, it came to the place where they had more gifts than they, than they knew what to do with. Jesus made some astounding statements to the common people in Galilee. Myra? Yeah, Matthew 6, 25 to 33. This is why I tell you not to be worried about food and drink you need in order to stay alive or about clothes for your body. After all, isn't life worth more than food? Isn't the body worth more than clothes? Look at the birds. They don't sow seeds, gather harvest, and put in barns. Yet their Father in Heaven takes care of them. Let me interrupt for just a second. Um, actually, in some parts of the world, the birds do sow seeds. Right. Yeah. They eat seeds, and oh, yes. when they, their droppings go here and there, that's a, that the plants a new Yeah, We've had seed, pomegranate so. trees come up from Bird birds. Dropping. Yeah. Sure okay. It wasn't the squirrels, huh? And Could have been, sure too. Birds. Probably <laughs> birds, though. Okay, where? Um, 26? 26. Well, you just read that, okay. Okay, 27. Can any of you live a bit longer by worrying about it? 
Maybe a little shorter. Yeah. And why worry about clothes? Look at all the wildflowers that grow. They do not work to make work or make clothes for themselves. But I tell you that not even King Solomon, with all his wealth, had clothes as beautiful as one of these flowers. It is God who clothes the wild clothes the wild grass, the grass that is here today and gone tomorrow, burn up in an oven. Won't he be all the more sure to clothe you? How little faith you have. So don't start worrying, where will my food come from, or my drink, or my clothes? These are things the pagans are always concerned about. Your Father in heaven knows that you knows that you need all these things. Instead, be concerned above everything else with the kingdom of God and with what he requires of you, and he will provide you with all these other things. Makes so, it sound easy. Yes. Yeah. That was something I was commenting about. How do we concern ourselves above everything else with the kingdom of God? Well, think about what the disciples did after Jesus was gone. Could could people do that kind of stuff in our day? I was talking to a student recently that was staying with us, and uh, he said, "I back in college, I for a short time I had a roommate who thought if he prayed for to do well on the test, he would." So he was out doing other things all day until 9 or 10 o'clock at night. Then he would come back to the room and study for a few minutes before he fell asleep. He didn't do very well. Really? Amazing. <laughs> Even in the Old Testament, Isaiah 26, verse 3 tells us the same thing. Isaiah 26, 3. You, Lord, give perfect peace to those who keep their purpose firm and put their trust in you. The Good News Bible. Okay, even in the times of the Old Testament, God promised, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if they pray to me and repeat, repent, I'm sorry, and turn away from the evil they have been doing, then I will hear them in heaven, forgive their sins, and make their land prosperous again from the Good News Bible. Going on with it from Ellen White, Whenever God's people in any period of the world have cheerfully and willingly carried out his plan of systematic benevolence, giving God a faithful tithe, and in gifts and offerings, they have realized the standing promise that prosperity should attend all their labors just in proportion as they obeyed his requirements. When they acknowledged the claims of God and complied with his requirements, honoring him with their substance, their barns were filled with plenty. But when they robbed God in tithes and in offerings, they were made to realize that they were not only robbing him, but themselves. For he limited his blessings to them just in proportion as they limited their offerings to him. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3. Doesn't that sound kind of like God is being... Let's see, did he give his tithe? Ah, he didn't. Do, okay, cut him back. Did you, do you ever have that worry when you were younger that um, if you don't pay your tithe, you may not um, work out so well? No, I mean the way your parents uh, yeah. talk. <laughs> yeah, I've had that idea. Is there some understanding or agreement? And this is your question, sort of you asked earlier, Gary. Is there some understanding or agreement in the great controversy that says that God cannot bless us unless we pay our tithes? Or is God just saying that we have not done our side of the contract, so he cannot do his? Is that, that, what, is that what happens? I don't think so. He's pretty gracious, actually. Is there a reason to have a contract if you don't have plan to, to abide by it? It's usually for our benefit because yeah, well, we true. need to trust. Can we trust this God or not? And he comes down and actually gives us a contract so that mm -hmm. it will help us trust him. 
Some might get the impression that paying a faithful tithe is a part of the working our way to heaven. Is tithing a part of a works religion? Nobody's going to explain that one to me. We could never earn salvation. I mean, think what God is hoping to give us. What could we possibly... There's a story told, and I'll tell it really quick, about a man who was very concerned to earning his way to heaven. And the pastor says, well, just, you know, work on things save up your money and so forth and be faithful in God's and so he started collecting US currency and they thought that's that's not gonna they're gonna work in heaven they won't recognize US currency I better start saving gold bars <laughs> so he started saving gold bars he said that'll surely be good in heaven so he according to this story of course a hypothetical story he has this su suitcase full of gold bars and he arrives at the Saint at the gate and there's Saint Peter he says oh, what do you have in your suitcase Oh, he says, look at, I brought all this gold. And St. Peter looks at him and says, why did you want to bring all that pavement up here? Of course, <laughs> <laughs> the streets are paved with gold up there, right? Earth. You know, if you really think about it, when we were first born, mm -hmm. we didn't really do anything to deserve that. So I think he's just extending that on, don't you? Yeah. Romans 4, 1 to 4, that's mine, is it? What, what shall we say then of Abraham, the father of our race? What was his experience? If he was put right with God by the things he did, he would have something to boast about, but not in God's sight. The scripture says Abraham believed God, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. Those who work are paid wages, but they are not regarded as a gift. They are something that has been earned. Good news, Bible. Well, some have said that if every Adventist would return a faithful tithe, our church would have, been, would have more than enough money to do all that it needs to do in spreading the gospel message. Think that's true? Yeah. Well, if they can handle all that money. <laughs> <laughs> Years ago, it was revealed that only about 25% of Adventists actually were returning a faithful tithe. And I don't remember when that happened, whether there was a, you know, a recession or whatever. I don't remember the situation. Do you think that's still true today? Well, sometimes I, w I wonder about a tithe. Does it really have to be money? Well, obviously in different times and different parts of the world, um, it, it's done in different ways, yeah. yeah when, they, when they make that uh, de determination that only some percentage is given tithe, they're, they're just looking at money mm -hmm. right then. Some people, yeah. yeah. I, uh, my, my brother was a student missionary down to South America, and he went to a very rural church, and they called for offering. And people brought up their squash and their pumpkins and their this and their that, all this stuff. And that was their offering. Probably their tithe too. Yeah. So, do you think this is, you think it's true that the, well, or is it possibly even worse today? Do we accept God's promises? Do we trust his contracts? And let's just say that the church all of a sudden was given all the money it needs to do all the things it wants to do. Would that finish the gospel? Only if they're preaching the right message. Oh, you're bringing more into the story here now. <laughs> Let us never forget that God's plan of salvation was arranged even before the creation of our world. God knew what was coming. So what is included in God's covenant with us now? Jim? From the Bible Study Guide, the covenant contains the law, whether written on stone or in our hearts, Deuteronomy 9, 11, and Hebrews 8, 10. Such a divine human alliance involves, on our part, diligent obedience rendered in love to the law and to the covenant, 1 John 5, 3. Some clauses of this covenant are more extensive. As such, the commandment to worship God alone and to love Him above all things, Deuteronomy 6.5 and Matthew 22, verses 36 and 37. 
But here, excuse me, but there are also specific commands within the covenant, na covenant, namely, number one, turn away from idolatry, Deuteronomy 31, 20. Number two, keep the Sabbath, Isaiah 56, 6. And number three, to observe certain food laws, Leviticus 11, Isaiah 65, 1 to 5, Isaiah 66, 15 to 18, from the Bible study guide for, I guess for the 26th. Page 26. Yeah, page 26. The teachers. Do we earn some merit in God's side by keeping his commandments? You know, there are Christian churches who believe that salvation is based on merits, and merits are demerits. If you have more sins than, than good deeds, then you're going to be lost. If you have more good deeds than sins, you're going to be saved. And under certain circumstances, you can pray that some of the saints who have been already sanctified according to the church uh, have extra merits they can give you some of theirs they can spare some of theirs and, and in some churches some of those merits quote unquote can be in the form of cash yes <laughs> or commodities yes very much so a card number that too <laughs> or is keeping god's commandments just the right thing to do if god knew in advance here's a question for you if god knew in advance that the children of Israel would turn away from him in so many ways and so often, why did he choose to work with them? Were they the best people he could find? They, certain were, they certainly weren't the biggest nation. Or were they chosen because they would demonstrate all the good and all the bad practices that God needed to teach us about? Maybe the other nations would only teach a couple of the good things and mostly the bad. Maybe they were the best that he had. Yeah. Some of God's instructions are very specific. Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 give very specific instructions about what should be eaten and what should not be eaten if you're living in that part of the world. Uh, some of those things don't apply to some other areas in the world, but for that area, it did. After generations of Israelites had failed to comply with God's commands, Isaiah wrote, I think that's... Is it my time? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it is. Uh, Isaiah 65, 1 through 5. The Lord said, I was ready to answer my people's prayers, but they did not pray. I was ready for them to find me, but they did not even try. The nation did not pray to me, even though I was always ready to answer, here I am, I will help you. I have always been ready to welcome my people who stubbornly do what is wrong and go their own way. They shamelessly keep on making me angry. They offer pagan sacrifices in sacred gardens and burn incense on pagan altars. At night, they go to caves and tombs to consult the spirits of the dead. Wow. They eat pork and drink broth made from meat offered in pagan sacrifices. And then they say to others, keep away from us, we are too holy for you to touch. <laughs> oh, brother. I cannot stand people like that. My anger against them is like a fire that never goes out. Boy, yeah. that's a pretty serious consequence of a contract broken, isn't it? Yeah. Pretty serious allegations there at the start, you know. Yeah, and I if was, you... I was ready to, to yeah. help you, but you never even looked for me. And a few verses later we read... Isaiah 66, 15 through 18. The Lord will come with fire. He will ride on the wings of a storm to punish those he is angry with. <clears throat> By fire and sword, he will punish all the people of the world whom he finds guilty, and many will be put to death. The Lord says, the end is nearer for those who purify themselves for pagan worship, who go in procession to sacred gardens and who eat pork and mice and other disgusting foods. Let me interrupt you there for just a second. Do you think that the children of Israel living in those days were going to the temple and pretending to worship God at the temple and also doing all these other pagan things during the week? The Bible strongly suggests that they did. Wow. I mean... One of their examples of uh, maybe being 
examples for others to see how yeah. far you can go down. Yeah. I wonder, well, I wonder what was uh, attracting them to do that. I've, God's ways are so good, and yet they, on their spare time, they do the other things. Well, one of the things that they all, that's pretty obvious in a number of places, these were fertility cult worships, worship services. So it was a fleshy thing. Yeah. yeah. That was part of it anyway. Verse so, 18. Yeah. I know their thoughts and their deeds. I am coming to gather the people of all nations. When they come together, they will see what my power can do and will know that I am the one who punishes them. Good news Bible. Wow. Is that good news that he punishes them? Wow. It sounds like they need it, but... <laughs> yeah, but... Does it sound like God is actively punishing those who do not do what he asks? Sounds when we like refuse to follow God's advice and paying tithes, are we violating a contract? Do we thus separate ourselves from the Lord? Bible study guide, uh, let's see, this is page 26. God's faithfulness to his, coven to his covenant is unshakable, Deuteronomy 4.31. But we haven't always answered him with faithfulness in return, Jeremiah 11.10. The one who provides riches also offers grace for obedience, making certain both our calling and election for Christ's kingdom, 2 Peter 1, 10 and 11. Okay, so the, that passage there suggests that God is saying he provides for all the necessities, making it possible for you to do what he requires, right? Let us try to be very clear about some of the terms that God used in the Bible in reference to us and our relationship to him. Gary? This is from the Bible study guide. The word covenant in Hebrew means bereth. The Hebrew word is bereth. Bereth. Appears approximately 285 times in the Old Testament. The New Testament, the Greek word for covenant is... Diatheke. Diatheke? Diatheke, okay. yeah. Glad I don't have to speak that, but that's okay. <laughs> it's Greek. This word, yeah, it's Greek to me. This word used in connection with the covenant between God and his people. C-T-K... Yeah, I just... It, the Encyclopedia Biblica. Go, go ahead. Okay. In modern times, the word, the word, oh, in modern terms, <laughs> the word corresponds to a contract, but also uses for an ally, alliance pact or testament. So those are other names for similar things, and some kind of an agreement, okay? Agreement, yeah. A covenant is not necessarily a law, despite being legally binding on the parties within the terms of the contract. Consequently, a law may sometimes be deemed a contract given that it is a covenant based on the law. However, law and covenant are conceptually different. Okay, so now let's think about that for a moment. Laws are usually done by organized entities, Congress or something else like this, and they apply to everybody, and often the people underneath don't have any control over that. They're, they're, there they are. A contracts mean, okay, you you an agreement. We could say right here in this room, okay, you and I, let's make a contract. We'll do this and this and this. And it may be a legal contract. Um, Jim could work up a legal contract for us. He has some legal expertise. And, and it would be, you know, it would be, we would need to do it to follow the law. But it's, it's, that's different than something that comes down from a higher organization. What would we, we, the law of gravity, we call that a law because that's the way things work. Yeah. And we could, by extension, we could say what we call the, the Ten Commandments, you could call that a law. Mm -hmm. 
because it is a description of the way things work. Right. It's a, a prescription. All of this other stuff is, are statutes, rules, regulations, and so on, which do really don't have the stature of, of law. That's, uh, that's right. another way of saying things, whether yeah. you agree with it or not. That's yeah, no, that's agree. correct. Okay. There, are, there are proscribed laws. Governments can, can say, well, we want, you have to pay your taxes or whatever. There are proscribed laws like that. But the Ten Commandments wasn't done that way. No. There are other laws, like you just said, that describe the way things work. Well, if you look at the laws of physics, there's no choice there. No, no. I mean, it, it, yeah. they follow it no matter what. But when you put laws on people, it's there's, a a cho there's a choice there, and it's exactly. a little different. How so it's really, it's a, to call it a law is, is a mis defining yeah. or a misapplication of the term. Mm -hmm. um, it, but to describe the way things work, like I said earlier, but what way, what says, uh, all, obey all my commands. No, he says, listen to my prescription. Mm -hmm. Now, you have it's a prescription. A you can do like I did years ago, uh, what, six, seven year, years ago. The doctor gave me a prescription. I think it might have been you for a high blood pressure yeah. medication. I took it home, put it on the kitchen counter, and nine months later, I had a, <laughs> a <Yes>. widow maker. <laughs> yeah. So I, I made a choice. <laughs> there were consequences to the making of that choice. Yeah. <laughs> if salvation is by grace and is a free gift, does that mean that we do not really need to meet the obligations of our covenant with God? That, of course, would be crazy. I mean, God is offering to work with us. He's saying, please be partners with me. He's a teacher. Yeah. A parent has a duty to teach his kids. Well, we are saved by faith. It is also true that faith works. So how do we develop this kind of excellent relationship with God that will lead to salvation? See, where are they? I think that's mine, huh? Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them out by hand and led them out of Egypt, although I was like a husband to them. They did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach the fellow citizen to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. So, and I always like to point out there, the goal of that whole thing is everyone is to know the Lord. And that's eternal life, John yeah. 17, 3. Another, another concept that we need to understand is the concept of law that Jim was trying to help us with a little bit ago, so now he gets to talk about it some more. Hmm. It's your turn. Yeah. Uh, my turn? Yep. Really? Um, laws are unilateral decisions from the lawgiver and not dependent on the other party's acceptance. These laws are promulgated by the lawgiver and must be obeyed. We don't participate in the process of making God's laws that are part of the divine covenant. It wouldn't make sense for us to have a law in a contract that was not meant to be kept. As such, both the old and the new covenants have law and obedience elements. For Hebrews 8, 8, 8 13. But that, that theory, I, I could quibble with some of that. A lot of it has to do with definitions again. Yeah. Some of God's dealings with us are straight promises. God promises to do certain things even if we do nothing. Carrie, can you talk to us about that? Similar to a decree, a promise is unilateral. God alone may make a promise. Trust in the promise depends on the credibility and ability of the one who promises. God promised and will deliver because he doesn't lie and never fails. God's promise of salvation by grace through faith to those who accept his covenants is an assurance for the redeemed. That's from Hebrews 6, 13 to 20, 1 John 2, 25. Okay. So now, the type of agreement that we have been talking about most of, mostly today is a covenant. And let's talk about that. 
from the Teacher's Bible Study Guide, a covenant needs at least two people, that is bilateral agreement, to be binding. So, you know, what would you have a covenant with one person? What would, I mean, what, what's the point? It's a promise. Okay. A covenant is different from a decree or promise in that there is no alliance or covenant without the contractual parties. In this regard, human beings decide whether they want to be a part of God's covenant or not. God invites us to enter his covenant by faith in Christ so that we may have eternal life, John 3, 16. Okay, from our Bible study guide, each individual has his responsibilities. <clears throat> that should be clear to Seventh-day Adventists. Remember the last verse in the famous three angels' messages? Revelation 14, 12. This calls for the endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Okay, so if, we, if we're going to say here that our agreement with God depends upon our keeping the commandments, we claim to be the ones who are telling the world about the three angels' messages, then we should be keeping the commandments, right? And we should be the examples and therefore the, the people who receive the great blessings. Are we being faithful to Jesus and keeping God's commandments as we should? Gary? Several things about covenants. Covenants. Uh, Bible study guide. Achievable means that the covenant's terms can be fulfilled by both parties. It, mean, it doesn't make sense to have the contract with rules that one of the parties is unable to observe. As such, honoring the terms of the covenant simply is doing what God requires by His grace, because grace brings forth good works. Ephesians 2, 8, 10. A third important aspect of a covenant is conditionality. Conditionality means that the contract is valid only if there is a practical adherence. Anyone who believes and is faithful will be saved, Revelation 2.10, and will be blessed, Malachi 3.10-12, uh, because this is part of the contract. They are complementary and basic blessings. Sin may hamper the receiving of some complimentary blessings in this world, but it does not change the basic blessings of salvation if we remain in the faith according to the contract from our Bible study guide. And finally, contracts have cancellation conditions. Jim? Cancellation conditions refer to the fact that all contracts provide a cancellation in provide for cancellation in certain special situations, such as in the case with God's covenant. The pro covenant parties who remain in sin may create the cancellation conditions by transgressing specific clauses from the Bible study guide. Okay. None of us can deny the fact that God bestows on us multiple types of blessings. One of those blessings is material benefits. And God has a work that needs to be uh, carried on through the auspices of the church. He asks us to return as uh, he asks us to return as first fruits a tithe of our income to support the work of the church on this earth. It is true that our relationship to the church, as exemplified by our faithful tithe paying, is an indication. Or is it true? I'm sorry that our relationship to the church as exemplified by our faithful tithe paying is an indication of our spiritual condition with God. Does tithe paying have anything to do with our spiritual condition? I think years ago, William Loveless had a thing and he says, your, where your pocket, pocketbook is where your heart is. <laughs> I see. That's another way to put that, isn't it? And, and then if the money stays there, that means you've got too much heart. <laughs> is it true? That, uh, I'm sorry. Returning to the experience of Hezekiah, we noticed that what the result was when the children of Israel did what God had asked them to do. Second Chronicles 31, 5 through 10. As soon as the order was given, the people of Israel brought gifts of their finest corn, wine, olive oil, and honey, and other farm produce. 
and they also brought the tithes of everything they had. All the people who lived in the cities of Judah brought tithes of their cattle and sheep, and they also brought large quantities of gifts, which they dedicated to the Lord their God. The gifts started arriving on the third month and continued to pile up for the next four months. When King Hezekiah and his officials saw how much had been given, they praised the Lord and praised his people Israel. The king spoke to the priests, and the Levites about these gifts. And Azariah the high priest, a descendant of Zadok, said to him, Since the people started bringing their gifts to the temple, there has been enough to eat and large surpluses besides. We have all this because the Lord has blessed his people. Is it reasonable to suggest that being faithful with our material possessions is a way of honoring God? Okay, Carrie. Paying a faithful tithe as the first fruits of our increase is what God asks of us. There should be no excuse for invalidating that agreement with God. And there should be no excuse for withholding from Him any condition of our contract. Consider these words from Ellen White. Let those who have become careless and indifferent and are withholding their tithes and offerings remember they are blocking the way so that the truth can go forth to the real Cannot go forth. Yeah, well, yes, cannot. I am bidden to call upon the people of God to redeem their honor by rendering to God a faithful tithe. And okay. That came out in 1905, Alan White. So what is implied by the words careless and indifferent? What does that have to do with tithe paying? And what about the words blocking the way? How could that block the way? Could these words apply to us in our faithfulness? Ellen White said in uh, 1899, every man should freely and willingly and gladly bring tithes and offerings into the storehouse of the Lord, because in so, in so doing there is a blessing. Councils on stewardship is where it's easily found. Okay, manuscript written in 1899, and Carrie? Do you remember where Ellen White was in 1899? Australia. She was in Australia. She wrote from down there. So let's think about this moment. Is it your experience when it comes time to pay your tithes and offerings that you're blessed? Is that your experience? Do we experience obviously blessings when we pay our tithe? Or is that a contract I mean, if you have a contract, and Jim, you're the guy, person with contracts, it's time to pray anyway. We've come to our end. <laughs> Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the blessings we enjoy and for the contracts you're offering to carry out with us. Uh, it's amazing that we should think that we could be partners of yours, but that's exactly what you offer. May that be our experience as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.